So I want to welcome everyone. Nice Saturday morning. The last uh, talk in our contemporary talk series of this year. I'm Stuart Harodner. I'm the artistic director here at the uh, Atlanta Contemporary Arts Center. I want to thank Lewis Cargan and Possible Futures for their funding throughout the season of these amazing lectures that we've had. Um, David asked me to say very little about him. That's kind of impossible just because it needs the gravitas of his background to give you some context for what he's going to address today. But I would tell you that one of the reasons we're extremely excited to invite David Plasker to Atlanta, a city he's familiar with in a couple of different ways, is his engagement with uh, book forms and certainly our engagement and the history of this institution and Nexus Press. And so uh, just to give you a little bit of, of background here, um, David currently, for the last few years, has been curator of prints and drawings uh, at MoMA. Prior to that, he worked in much smaller uh, scenarios, uh, but equally rigorous. Um, he kind of started uh, early in his career working with a range of artists, uh, pop artists, minimalist artists, conceptual artists, uh, specifically Klaus Oldenburg and Kuzja van Bruggen, um, developing projects with them. He went on to work at the infamous Printed Matter, which is the artist bookstore of great significance, which was sort of where um, in the early 70s in uh, the west side and on Lispenard Street uh, was the first time I came in contact with work of artists making work as working with books, working with expanded ideas about books. And so his involvement with Printed Matter and championing the alternative publications by artists and rethinking how artists might work with book forms uh, eventually led him to open a very interesting gallery slash bookstore slash alternative site for these kinds of endeavors called Specific Object. And for people who are up on their art history, anybody want to recall the, where that word comes from? Anyone? Judd. Judd. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so already that phrase, specific object, gets at a kind of clarity that his work for many years has had. And so uh, without further ado, I just want to turn the, the uh, morning over to David. He'll tell you a little bit about what he's been up to these many years, and then we'll have a little conversation and entertain your, uh, your questions. So without further ado, David Platzker. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I tend to talk for about 30, 40 minutes, and afterwards I'd like having dialogue. Um, it's a lot more interesting than giving you a, a monologue. Uh, the presentation I have sort of takes you through a line about some of the things that I'm thinking about. And there's, it's not scripted in the sense that I don't, obviously don't have notes in front of me. And the idea for me is to sort of work through ideas as I discuss them with you. A couple of months ago, a friend of mine sent me a handmade postcard uh, when platitudes become norms. And it has a number of levels of meaning to me. It's obviously a play on my last name, P-L-A-T, platitude, P-L-A-T-Z-K-E-R being my last name. Um, I had to remind myself what the word platitude meant, just to, for clarity's sake dull or insipid. And what my friend Jean-Noël Erlon was driving at also was that it had an interplay with a very famous exhibition from 1969 that was originally curated by uh, Harold Zisman for the Kunsthal Bern titled When Attitudes Become Form, When Attitudes Become Norm. The, the exhibition Platitude, uh, When Attitudes Become Form was conceived of as the first exhibition that drew together in Europe um, elements of pop art, minimal art, conceptual art. Uh, it was an exhibition where artists were brought to Bern to execute their installation pieces. And for many artists, it was their first European exposure. Artists like Lawrence Wiener, Robert Berry, uh, among others, uh, had not had any institutional exposure at this point in their careers in Europe. Um, if you can think of Lawrence Wiener's piece titled a 36 by 36 removal of lath and plaster from a wall surface that was first executed there in Bern. 
the show became iconic, and the catalog takes the form of sort of a, a loose leaf notebook, and uh, for many years has been one of those things that have been quite coveted. Uh, typical for many exhibitions of its period, you could have found the catalog for five or ten dollars for many, many years, probably up until the mid 70s, and more recently, it regained this patina of both history and age and value. And so more recently, it became like a $750 type of publication. And this is what that, that one of those rooms of that exhibition looked like in the Kunsthalburn. And far back, you can see uh, Eva Hess, for example, Richard Tuttle, among others. What was so interesting about thinking about this exhibition is that it's become this heralded exhibition to the degree that the curator Germano Chalant felt inspired to recreate it. And if you were in Venice this past summer, the Venice Biennale, you could have gone to the Prada Foundation, which is a beautiful palazzo from the 15th, 6th, early 16th century, in which Germano recreated the footprint of the Kunsthalle Bern, a building that was built in the beginning of the 20th century, uh, and took over the architecture of the palazzo and reconstructed it. So if you remember what the last slides looked like, now what you're seeing is that within the palazzo, the architecture of the palazzo, this beautiful frieze wall, freestanding within what is the Kunsthal Burn, with many of the same artworks from the original 1969 exhibition inserted into that environment, uh, reframing it and recontextualizing it, and changing the way that we look at not only the work of that period, but also the way that we reflect on how that exhibition originally appeared in 1969. So now we're in the 21st century looking at a show of the mid to uh, uh, portion of the 20th century, reframed within the architecture of the 16th century palazzo, which replicates this, the sculpture, the architectural of environment of a 20th century, early 20th century building. All this layering and context changes dramatically. And so obviously uh, Jean-Noël's card to me uh, reframes it again, you know, when attitudes become form, when platitudes become norm, and how dull and insipid he was thinking that this exhibition was, because it, it, re, it reframed it in such a way that it contextualized it someplace awkwardly for him. I like context. I think context is really interesting. And sort of to play that out, I want to demonstrate just sort of one more way of looking at context. This is Iggy Pop. Iggy Pop was the quintessential bad boy musician of the 1960s and early 70s. So this is Iggy Pop who invented stage diving. This is Detroit 1970, year after when attitudes become form the quintessential stage dive where he's now out in the audience smearing peanut butter on himself. <laughs> Iggy Pop's a lot older now. <laughs> and this is what Iggy looks like now. He's still, still performing. And about a year and a half ago, there was an interview in the New York Times uh, with Iggy Pop. You know, they have that one page in the Times where they uh, interview someone on the Sunday afternoon. And uh, he gets off this wonderful quote. Uh, he says, uh, I said that after doing a concert, uh, it was said after doing a concert in Tibet, uh, uh, let's see. I said I was going to do a concert for Tibet at Carnegie Hall, which I did because Philip Glass asked me to. But yeah, I was a little impulsive, and Lenny was playing I Want to Be a Dog Too Damn Slow, and I just ran out of ideas. This is what I'm Context is everything, right? You can't stage that at Carnegie Hall, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly not at the Tibet Rainforest whatever concert, uh, and, as he, Iggy, was calling it. And context remains so much about how we look at things. I mean, as a curator, and you put two things together, the context for how those things look together is always changing. Uh, I'm sort of in this amazingly privileged situation that Museum of Modern Art in my department, we have close to 95,000 objects 
the Department of Drawings and Prints. And we have limited capacity to show things on an ongoing basis, so we're constantly trying to reinvent the way that we tell our narrative about our collection. Uh, what artists go together, what periods of time mash together, how this sort of tells a broader picture. Either tell these things is very narrowly defined or, much bro or very broadly defined. And one of the ways that this becomes interesting to me is perhaps by looking at some of the books that ours have published. You can think about Ed Roche. And Ed Roche on the, you see Ed lying on the floor here, the collection of 14 of his artist books. This was a picture that was probably taken around 1978. Um, and on the right hand side, you see that collection of his artist publications. Um, in 1963, Roche started publishing artist books almost one a year, one every other year, beginning with a publication titled 26 Gasoline Stations. And if you're familiar with these books, um, you'll know that 26 Gasoline Stations, for example, is quite literally reproductions of 26 gasoline stations. Uh, someone who was working for me once upon a time described them as being, in photographs as being taken by someone who is just too damn lazy to get out of the car. <laughs> And Roche puts forward really that the gasoline stations are just pure information. The, art, the photographs within these books are really about just providing you with a narrative context. That it's not about beautiful photography. Um, I put forward that they look like they're profiles of starlets. That uh, they're all sort of taken at this really particular angle that highlights the features and shows you uh, both the strengths and the weaknesses of the imagery. Artist books, as defined by printed matter, were books that were done in editions of 100 copies or greater, generally unsigned in a number, relatively inexpensive at the point of publication, meaning that 1970, when these books were in quantity and available, they were selling for probably five to ten dollars a piece. And the notion that they were these inexpensive articles was really about disseminability, democraticness. That is, that these things could infiltrate into our world. Uh, that people would come to acquire them both either as things they wanted to cherish, uh, they could get them as being disposable on some level, uh, they could go on a bookshelf, they could go in your back pocket, they go in the trash can. Um, and because they were done in such a way that uh, they were easily transported, they really had this capacity to infiltrate the world at large. Uh, Ed used them in all sorts of different ways that were really quite interesting. Uh, and what's really interesting about the content is in, in the terms of the printed matter world, the artist book should be um, artwork for the page. That is, when you're interacting with the book, you're essentially being invited into a performative space. The book has a performative space. The content should be driven towards the book-like format, meaning that it's not repurposing a pre-existing imaging. Um, that is, it's not a book that documents paintings or sculptures. Rather, the book itself is the hermetic art object. So Roche did 13, 14 of these books between 63 and 1978. And they come up quite frequently now. You can see that this set, which was inscribed to a Los Angeles collector, sold for $96,000. If you had collected them all at the point of publication, you would have probably paid three or $400. There's one in there titled Stains that is the outlier that today would garnish the highest value. We get a sense that all these, all these things begin as one object, that is to say, inexpensive, disseminable, democratic. Over time, they acquire this patina that become recontextualized as valuable artwork. The thing that I've loved about Roche's books is that you tend to find them all over the place. Um, I was at the Walker Art Center uh, not too long ago, and they had a really beautiful little display of some of Roche's books. On the left, you see a shadow, which is part of that book called um, Royal Road Test. You see the edge of crackers on the far right. The bottom is um, uh, the swimming pools title. In the middle is one titled Business Cards, which was a collaboration with Bill Al Bankston, where the two of them graphically designed business cards for each other and exchanged them at a party. So that's, that's the cover of it. And they're at a, a fancy dinner, and they're handing off business cards to each other. Um, this was the only book that the two of them did together. It's also the only one that um, was signed by both artists on the cover. So every copy sort of belies this notion that they're supposed to be democratic, that these were specialized. What's really cool is that 
from time to time, when you see Rouché books, you see them inscribed and dedicated. And often you're going to find that they're dedicated to boyfriends, girlfriends, um, movers and shakers in the art world, people that Ed wanted to disseminate himself out to. Um, as an artist who was based in Los Angeles, you can imagine that he wasn't going to New York all that often, for example. And he would uh, send a copy out to, say, Leo Castelli or other dealers in New York City as a means of reminding them of his presence. Uh, he would then travel to the city and say, hey, got my last book. We also know that he was doing this um, as a means for getting attention. And he wasn't the only one. So in the copy from the Walker Art Center, you see the inscription from Billy Al Bankston, a bribe for Martin. Martin was the director at the museum. And you know that uh, Billy Al was going to follow up with a phone call and say, hey, when's my show? When I got to Printed Matter in 1998, um, the organization was then located on Wooster Street. And this is the facade of the space on Wooster Street. And Printed Matter briefly was founded in 1976 by artists and art workers, primarily people like Solowit, Lucinda Park, Carl Andre, Edith Tack, Walter Robinson, among others, as a means for providing distribution services for artists who had been making artist books since the 1960s. And you think about that formative group of artists, they probably all got up on the phone and called their friends up and said, hey, I know you've got a box of books. Uh, why don't you send them to us? We'll help them get them into the world. It's really sort of this utopian ideal. And some of the things that Printed Matter was stocking from its inception are things like Lucy Lepard's um, cards that she'd done as an exhibition, first in Seattle and then in Vancouver, where the idea was the exhibition was to take place on these index cards. The works could be executed um, at will based upon the reading of the instructions on these cards. Or things like Saul DeWitt's book, which is lines in four directions in four colors, so vertical, horizontal, diagonal in both directions. You can see the back cover, how that overlays. The, the yellow is vertical, the black is horizontal, the red is diagonal from left to right, the blue is diagonal from right to left, and all their combinations. So you can match what the interior of the book looks like, and you can sort of see this from the diagram on the back. All these overlaying colors, very conceptual and very beautiful. Or books like Gordon Matter Clark. And this is a project where Gordon Matter Clark was cutting a home apart in the way that he decided that he wanted to document the process, because not everyone could see the home, was to make it into an artist publication. And the publication is a standalone object that um, helped disseminate the notion of what this project was, but yet itself the book was its own project in its own right. Or the Fluxus um, generation was doing projects like uh, George Breck's Water Yam. So that was the hallmark of printed matter publication, sort of a multiple with loose cards, instruction-based art. Or say the artists of the 1980s, people like Barbara Bloom, and this is her book titled The Reign of Narcissism. And the Reign of Narcissism is the guidebook to her installation titled The Reign of Narcissism. And in this exhibition installation, you can see uh, Barbara Bloom's uh, bust uh, has now been become the focal point of the entire show. She's made brooches, vases, uh, chocolates, everything that has her, her visage as part of the exhibition and part of the objecthood, her, her narcissistic reign. And probably the next step being people like uh, Richard Prince. And these were all sorts of people that were so important to printed matter. And sort of the programming that was interesting to me when I became director there was to think about more broadly, what did artists do in serial? So we did a show with the band Sonic Youth. We called it Sonic Matters, Sonic Collaborations. And it was a look at all the things that the band had intersected with in the visual art world. Um, the artists that designed covers for their albums, uh, t-shirts, all that sort of uh, ephemeral type material. Here you're seeing it within the context of the store. And then when we moved to Chelsea, we did this more of this sort of programming where we had a more clearly defined way of presenting it. So this would be Jenny Holzer, General Idea, uh, Yoko Ono, and Tom Sachs. I'll tell you how old this picture is. is the child sitting on the counter in the pink shirt is my daughter. She was probably, what, about four at the time. She's now 14, so this is 10 years ago. And you can get a sense of just, you know, printed matter was a fairly big place. It's about 
2,000 square feet of, of running bookshelf space, and it gets very crowded. And one of the joys of being in such a place like that was that you had uh, annual user base of about 7,500 artists consigning books, and we had an inventory of uh, close to 12,000 to 13,000 titles, an inventory base of over 100,000 pieces of book. And it ranged everywhere from art stars, so Lawrence Wiener with uh, some uh, penthouse uh, pets, to people like uh, the Saint Reverend Jen. Reverend Jen is the patron saint of the uncool. Uh, here she is uh, in her uh, Spock ears, or her troll ears. And the sorts of things that she did was she, uh, in her apartment in the Lower East Side, has a troll museum. I encourage you to go visit her troll museum. She could use the money. And then she, Reverend Jen was publishing our artist books, very much different in the physicality, the sense of many of the things that came before her. Uh, careful what you wish for. This is the story of the young Reverend Jen and how she becomes an art star. I bet you haven't heard of her before. The thing that really always interests me was what one can do with a book. Um, certainly, you can read it in the traditional sense. Uh, you can page through it. What we're looking at is a book designed by the German artist Wolfgang Stell. It documents the collection of Peter and Irene Ludwig, who were major collectors of art in the 1960s. They produced over a span of two years five versions of this book, each version continually getting about 50 to 100 pages bigger as they continued to collect more and more art. So hopefully what you're going to see in just a moment is what they did was build a catalog resume of all these artists. And you'll see that there's a mylar sheet for each artist that will have the image of the artist. So here we've got Joseph <coughs> Albers. And then you'll see all the pieces in the collection by Albers, Carl Andre, etc. What was so cool about this book was that not only is it document an artist and it is designed by artists, uh, designed to uh, house a particular collection, it tells a narrative about collecting, about the context of the collecting, the context of the artists that are being placed in the collection. And Peter Ludwig was a fairly controversial guy. He uh, had made his fortune through his uh, father-in-law's company, which he was running, which was a chocolate company. People say that he exploited his workers uh, by consistently undervaluing, underselling uh, his competitors. He drove other chocolate manufacturers out of business. Uh, he expanded to Eastern Europe. Uh, and then ultimately, uh, he pulled off this amazing stunt by which he parked his collection at the Ludwig Museum in Cologne. Uh, the museum was named after him, and he continued to control it and add additional art to it through tax breaks. Um, so essentially, the German state and the city of Cologne were subsidizing his capacity to collect, although the city itself didn't retain ownership of the art. So Hans Hacke, the, the very well-known uh, artist who uh, was interested in deconstructing the history of art and art collecting, did a book about it called The Chocolate Master. And I was interested in doing a show where you look at how that book explodes out. So here you're seeing all the pages of the book removed. So you're seeing two copies, about 1,000 pages. And that's mashed up now with the uh, Hans Hacke book. So you can reflect on both ends of the spectrum, the, the mass collecting, as well as what Hans Hacke was interested in doing about deconstructing Peter Ludwig. When I left Printed Matter, I was interested in finding a space that um, was everything that Printed Matter was not, which is to say that I didn't want to be accessible. So to find me, you had to go down this long hallway, down another very long hallway, very large building in Chelsea. I was on the uh, second mezzanine, the 2M floor. And it was sort of like being John Malkovich. You had to scoot down because those bulkheads were about seven feet high, six feet high. And you get to my door. And uh, you might find that during the exhibition, the gallery would be closed. If you didn't get in, there would be a little gallery. And then there was books, lots and lots of books. I am a hoarder. Um, I think the rule at our house now is that any book that comes in, one book must go out. 
have to have a storage unit for all of the extra stuff. And sort of the, sh the additional sorts of programming I was interested in doing uh, revolved around notions of publications and what those publications can be on a more uh, exhibition style scale. For example, this is a, a, a record that was produced as the exhibition catalog for an exhibition called Art by Telephone that was done in 1969 at the Museum of Contemporary in Chicago. The museum had recently been refurbished. Um, it was a brand new building and they went wildly over budget during the course of construction. Rather do a show about contemporary sculpture, which would have been exceedingly expensive to produce, the director realized quickly that he had to come up with a new project. The project he decided to come up with was an exhibition that was done strictly by telephone. You can imagine what this sounds like. He gets on the phone, calls up international artists long distance, talking 1969, so it's crackly voices, and uh, asks them to tell them what to do at the museum. So my version of the show was to put the record on the turntable and let visitors come in and listen to the record. And we executed one piece of art, and that is the Saul the Wit from the record. Let me play that one. Saul the Wit. Uh, I want to, using a hard pencil, draw a 16 by 16. that so much of the art of the 1960s was about disseminability. Whether that means conceptual art as uh, a reference tool for disseminability or artist books, uh, it was really quite incredible that a particular generation hit upon the idea that doing something didn't necessarily involve physicality. And you can be quite cynical in also thinking about what it costs as an art by telephone to do an exhibition. It's shipping something from point A to point B is both a labor and an expense. You can think about what happens to so many of the artists of this conceptual generation. Artists like LeWitt, Wiener, Robert Berry, Hanna Darboven, who can make art that is quite slight physically, um, and its representation can be quite thin. And it afforded this amazing capacity for them to be disseminated as artists when an exhibition was being done uh, in Germany, perhaps. Uh, the artists didn't have to send anything, perhaps just themselves. You think about the economy of scale that was then traded through multiple venues, how easy it would become to disseminate. This became an art of opportunity for many institutions. I kind of love this idea that books have this wild capacity to do things other than sit on their asses in museums. <clears throat> You can think about how other artists sort of thought about this in similar contexts. This is the cover of Raymond Pettibone's first book, Captive Chains, from 1978. And while Raymond Pettibone has become an exceedingly well-known and traded artist in the last, say, 20 years, his origins are really quite amazing. This is a guy who um, started his career not thinking of himself as a formal artist, but rather someone who was making artist books gig flyers in service of the band Black Flag and the record label from Southern California SST Records, which his brother founded. 
you would, uh, as a high school student in LA, you would see these things stapled to telephone poles around the city or uh, taped up to lockers around uh, your campus. And this was a really incredible way of just seeing things in, in very raw state. From 1978 to 1986, uh, Patty Bone created uh, about 32 artist publications. Uh, he was the, the sort of the, the logo and the design of, of a generation. And so an exhibition perhaps could be all of those flyers, and all of those zines, and the skateboards and the t-shirts, the record covers, the flyers, uh, the posters for promotion, and his first prints. When the band breaks up in 1986 and Pettibone has a falling out with his brother, it also is the same year that he becomes a well-known artist. It's the same year that he has his first one-man exhibition in New York City. And it was those sort of prehistories that were really engaging to me. The other thing that's always been really engaging to me are orders like myself. So when I began talking about uh, when platitudes become norm, this is Jean-Noël Erlen, who was a Frenchman living in New York now since the 1950s who is a classic hoarder. And his program has been that he has fostered relationships with dealers and collectors, uh, artists in New York City. And he inspired them to put shopping bags by their front door. On a regular basis, he would come by and pick up those shopping bags. He would bring all those shopping bags home. And being something of an agrophobe, he would take the contents of those shopping bags that he had gathered up and then put them into files. So for the last 35 years, he has been making artist files. And this is the file for Bruce Nauman. And John Noel, being a uh, complete technophobe, has done this all by hand. And each file is in chronology, from the beginning of an artist's career, You're looking at photographs that were sent out by Castelli Gallery, his first announcement card for Conrad Fisher. And all of this is cross-referenced so that if uh, Bruce Nauman was in a group exhibition, there's going to be a card in this file that you'll see in a moment. they will tell you to go look at another file. Uh, he would also tear out periodicals and uh, add them to the file. This is uh, Bruce, uh, Bruce Nauman's first book, Burning Small Fires. Another photograph. That's a little cross-reference card. Clear Sky, another one of uh, Nauman's uh, artist publications. And I thought it would be great fun to program with this sort of material. The other thing that really in, in, intrigued me was artists that were thinking about publications in a, in a completely off-kilter sort of way. So this is Dan Graham. In 1966, Dan Graham has a gallery in New York City called the John, John Daniels Gallery. It lasts for one season before going bankrupt. Dan Graham gave Saul LeWitt, for example, his first one-man show. And as Dan goes bankrupt, he has to move back to New Jersey to live with his parents. This is an image out of Dan Graham's uh, Homes from America series, which documents some of the things that he had to go back and re-experience with his family. And just to think how, in Dan's world, Dan started wondering, why did his gallery fail? And he hit upon the idea that it failed because the exhibitions didn't get reviewed. If the exhibitions didn't get reviewed, then what was the point of having the exhibition? If the exhibition didn't have to happen, then what was the point of making art? And he decided ultimately that he wanted to circumvent the gallery system, circumvent the standardized system for getting art into the world. And he decided that he, was gonna, he himself, Dan Graham, was going to start making publications, make art, and his idea was to start inserting them into places that you wouldn't necessarily expect to find artwork. So for example, in Harper's Bazaar, in March of 1968, you would see this piece titled Figurative, this tape alongside a bra ad. And that was Dan's insertion into the art world. And Dan started collecting these things and doing these projects. Um, one of which was called Detna Essence. And I talked to Dan because I would see Dan in the post office, which is now a uh, Apple store in New York City. And I'd say, Dan, I want to do a show with you. And Dan would go, what do you want to do? 
And I said, Dan, I want to do a show about all your publications. Since 1968, you've been doing all these projects for publication. What would it look like to do this sort of project? And he goes, OK, do it. And so what I decided with Dan was that I was going to go out, and in the back of every exhibition catalog, there's always this bibliographic thing, projects by the arts. And I decided that I was going to do a show with Dan where I went out and found every original version. It wasn't enough simply to gather up the information. I actually wanted the physicality of finding all of these projects for publication. And finding the art publications is relatively easy. Finding an issue, back issue of art form, Studio International Art News, that's all relatively easy. But Dan made my life difficult by doing projects in places that were hard to find. Uh, probably through the economy of needing to do things cheaply, Dan hit upon the idea of wanting to place personal ads in porn magazines. And that personal ad would be like this piece, in essence, in which he's seeking a professional medical writer to write about the male experience post-ejaculation. And Dan wanted the professional medical writer to write this, and then Dan was going to claim it to be his own work and put it into a periodical titled Aspen. And this creates a problem for him because while it's very easy to find art periodicals, it's exceedingly difficult to find vintage 1960s porn. <laughs> So it took me about a year to do it, and you literally do find people living in basements, places where they hoard pornography. And you can't simply call them up and say, hey, go through all your porn magazines and find me a personal ad. Uh, if I was looking for a particular writer or a woman, that would be easy, but the personal ads became complicated. And so I ended up buying porn by the pound. <laughs> Uh, Dan made my life particularly hard because he didn't tell you where these pieces were originally published. So I ended up buying boxes, about, bought literally one ton of porn. And as you start flipping through these periodicals of the 1960s, you get a sense of what porn was at that point in time. It's a very different world. And lo and behold, in the circle on the top left, you can see that I found Dan's piece. Turns out Dan did the same piece six times in six different porn periodicals. I collected all this up and I felt an amazing sense of accomplishment that I've now learned a lot about the porn world. And just to give you context, this is the, the Aspen periodical that uh, it was originally intended to appear in. It does not look like a porn periodical at all. It was a periodical with Susan Sontag, George Breck, and John Cage, Max Newhouse, Robert Rauschenberg, Marcel Duchamp, all as contributors. And I ended up doing a show uh, in Vancouver uh, where we displayed every piece of ephemeral material and every publication by Dan. And so here you see the vitrines of all of his periodicals where he's done publications. And again, these are artist projects. They're not uh, recapitulations of pre-existing art. This is all projects for publication. And we reprinted one of the periodicals in your review of Sex and Politics and Aerospace. And you can take a free copy away. And we installed Dan in the show. <laughs> yeah, I was really excited because uh, he had told me that he loved John Chamberlain, the sculptor. So we built a John Chamberlain couch for Dan, and we put out display copies. And so Dan decided to take him out on his couch. The thing about having porn in your office and pretty much working by yourself is that you kind of have to look at it. Um, and I had a lot of it to look at. And as you start looking at it, it becomes really interesting because there's this really interesting moment in the late 60s and very early 70s where cultures are colliding. And the cultures that are colliding are the, the alternative culture of the late 60s and how it infiltrates everything. So this is Andy Warhol's advertisement for his movie titled Fuck. Um, he later retitles this movie Blue Movie, so it can actually be shown and distributed. Uh, and there's all these funny moments where you look at this stuff and you go, how did that happen? So John Chamberlain, the minimal sculptor, well, he's also a porn photographer. He's taking photographs of ultraviolet. Um, Peter Hujar, who's an uh, exceedingly well-known photographer, was doing contract photography of naked families. How 60s can you get? Uh, Klaus Oldenburg on the left, um, Klaus Oldenburg did porn. Uh, 
And when you talk to many of these artists, you say, well, how did this happen? And they all say, well, it's just part of our culture. That uh, we didn't see this as being porn. We saw it as being part of our life. It got stranger and stranger. The first issue of Screw Magazine, November of 1968, the centerfold is Yoikusama. And then you start looking in the fine print, and you see that Kusama had a, uh, a painting flesh and uh, service where you could come and hire her for your party, and she would come and paint you. And there's something really weird going on because Kusama, in particular, is a hustler in the respect that now there are periodicals like Adam, where you see Kusama appear. staging fashion shows as, uh, as political fundraisers, or as, uh, as part of her art making process. To the degree that she even had her own porn magazine. <laughs> Samba presents an orgy of nude love, beauty, sex. And so, you know, if you were there in the 1960s, this is what you would have experienced. It was also a money-making vehicle for an artist. You know, in the back, of course, were the paid advertising. That's where the money was being made. But it was very much her art vehicle. It was part of her notion of getting herself disseminated. And about four years ago, I ended up deciding that there was enough material out there to warrant doing a show. And my wife, Susan England, who's here someplace. Susan, still here? There you are. Uh, I her gallery for the summer. Uh, did a show about porn, a show called Screw You. And you can get a sense that it was a lot of everything. Um, it was pansexual. There was something for every proclivity. Uh, the idea was to take the artists that were within all of these periodicals and to match them up with art that were being made within that period of time. So photographs by Peter Hujar, the drawings by Kusama, John Chamberlain photographs. Uh, Bridget Polk from the Warhol scene was part of that uh, generation, her Polaroids. Uh, John Lennon and Yoko Ono, uh, Mel Ramos, Carolee Schneeman. All these people were part of that generation. And it was so fascinating to see that people like uh, Gregory Batcock, who was the first writer on minimal and conceptual art, was a porn writer. He was writing on a weekly basis about porn movies. He was eventually killed by a gay hustler. Now you step back into the 1980s and early 1990s, and you get a sense of how context has changed so radically. So this is a book titled Why I Got Into Art by Mike Kelly. And Mike Kelly says, why you got into art? Well, it was because of the naked women. So Linda Bangless, and how Linda Bangless's picture now has been recontextualized from the original 1974 art form ad that she had placed and how Bangless herself recontextualized that as a fundraiser. This is the t-shirt that she did in order to pay for the ad in Art Forum magazine. Or Hannah Wilkie, who um, called herself a living sculpture. And if you, you can see on the top, that she's slotted that can so that she was going out and shaking the can for money. Double entendre, no doubt, right? <laughs> And how Richard Prince then decides that he's going to do an Arizona iced tea as a play against Hannah Welke. So you can see his iced tea with Richard Prince. And as I said at the beginning, everything's about content. So just to, to sort of round this all back, this is the show that I currently have up at the Museum of Modern Art, my first show. I've been there now for exactly one year and one week. And when I first got there, I was told, you have three months to put together an exhibition to introduce John Cage's seminal work, 433, into the collection. The piece had been acquired the year before. And just so everyone uh, remembers, 433 is uh, John Cage's so-called silent piece. It instructs uh, a performer to perform any instrument, any number of performers, and for 4 minutes and 33 seconds through three timed movements, make no performative gesture, not to play a note. 
it's sort of this magic trick in 433 that is that um, while your focus is on the performer who is at, on stage with an instrument and not performing, you're becoming engaged with the environment that you're sitting in. And, uh, it's nothing up my sleeve but the actions over here, as the magician would do it. It's really about becoming attuned to the, your surroundings, that sort of magical passing through boredom into fascination. So the show that I wanted to put together introduces Cage through the notion that he himself was deeply involved not only with the Museum of Modern Art. His first performance in New York takes place at the museum in uh, February of 1943, 71 years ago. And here's pictures of that performance. John Cage is here in the flat top and the tuxedo. To his right is Merce Cunningham, who is a, a percussion player in, in Cage's percussion orchestra. In 433 itself, of course, has to be part of the show, and it's this very thin artist publication. Literally quite just lines on a page. So the first movement being 30 seconds, the second movement being 2 minutes and 33 seconds, and then the final movement of 1 minute and 40 seconds. And when you think about what that is, and that is that you know, when you script something, when you script a piece of art, you have a sense of how something might transpire, but you have no sense of how it actually will transpire. And for Cage, that comes to Marcel Duchamp. And this is Duchamp's infamous piece, Three Standard Stoppages. And the physicality of the piece is three threads, three one meter threads that allegedly Duchamp drops and then he affixes them where they fall. And then he makes these wooden, what he calls stoppages, that become new systems of measurement that mirror the, the shape of the fallen thread. And Cage becomes introduced to Duchamp uh, sort of by happenstance, that in 1943, when he comes to New York, he comes at the invitation of Peggy Guggenheim. Peggy Guggenheim's parents invite him to the city. Uh, what, what they think is going to be to premiere Cage's music in the city at Art of the Century, Peggy Guggenheim's gallery. And Cage, being a young guy in his 20s, does what so many young people does do. He goes around the city and circumvents the Guggenheims by hustling up for other opportunities. And as I said, he comes to the Museum of Modern Art, hustles the museum into giving him a night of performance undermining Peggy Guggenheim's premiere. In the course of a cocktail party, the evening that Peggy Guggenheim finds out about this circumvention, she decides to cancel the concert and to evict him from uh, the guest house and cut off his stipend. Cage has this wonderful story about how he says he has a nervous breakdown in the midst of the cocktail party, that uh, he becomes uh, uncontrollably uh, sobbing and Duchamp, who's also staying at the Guggenheims that evening, ushers him off into his sitting room. And while Duchamp sits in a rocking chair, smoking a pipe, uh, he asks Cage to tell him what's transpired. Cage spills out his woes the same way perhaps that someone would talk to an analyst. And it's the beginning of the relationship from 1943 to Duchamp's death in 1968 that really marks this amazing formative change in the way that Cage looks at art. And it's all through this notion of chance operation and determinancy. It becomes this hallmark era where you go from very scripted sense of how one goes about making music to becoming incredibly unscripted. That, well, I'm going to tell you basically what you're going to do, you're going to do it all on your own. You think about the snippet I pay, played for you of Saul DeWitt. And Saul DeWitt talking about he's going to put forward instructions. And he's going to tell you you're going to make a 30 by the 30, uh, 60 by 60 inch square. You're going to grid it 3,600 squares. You're going to put all these marks in it. But it's up to you to actually execute it and to have a certain amount of play with the opportunity. That's going to be a hallmark of what Cage is really going to become engaged in. <coughs> and the other artists that Cage really becomes engaged with even uh, predate his relationship with Duchamp, people like Mark Toby. Mark Toby being someone who's really interested in studying the cracks in sidewalks. 
someone who can take a 10 minute walk to a Chinese restaurant and stretch it into hours is he's going to be interested in the calligraphy of detritus on the sidewalk. Or people like Robert Rauschenberg. Robert Rauschenberg's white paintings are instrumental to Cage in thinking about how one can finally execute a piece that's all silent. Think about Rauschenberg's white paintings. Uh, Cage refers to them as metronotes, that they are these objects that are flat white, un art unarticulated surfaces that change through the course of a day. If you were to place one against this wall across from me, it'd start off being gray in the morning and turn bright white in the afternoon, gray back in the evening, and then black at night. You can imagine how shadow and dust in the world around it play against it. The painting itself becomes a performative object. And Cage is really engaged with that. He really thinks that that's quite amazing. As early as 1948, Cage is thinking about wanting to make a silent work. He muses that maybe he'll make something for the Muzak Corporation. Can you imagine getting into an elevator and hearing Muzak? Well, what, how much nicer it'd be perhaps to get into an elevator and hear nothing. In, in the summer of 1952, early August of 1952, Cage is at the Black Mountain School, uh, Black Mountain College, and he meets Rauschenberg for the first time, sees these white paintings, and becomes incredibly interested in how these things do exactly for him visually what he wants to do sonically. And about three weeks later, 433 is first premiered in Woodstock, New York. It's a sort of miraculous moment that changes so much about the way that we think about space and physicality, uh, the way that we think sonically about a movement or an articulation of space. And it's a hallmark piece that many of the artists that come of age in the 1960s are greatly indebted to. So if you see this show that's at the museum, you'll also see that there's this little set of photographs. And in this photograph in the top left, with the man with his arm up, that's Alan Capro. And Alan Capro is talking to Robert Whitman. And the man in the suit in the middle top, that's George Breck. And at the bottom, you're going to see Dick Higgins. And these are all artists that are associated with the Flux and Happening Movement. And all artists who were students of Cage. 1958, Cage is teaching at the New School of Social Research in New York City. He's teaching a course in experimental composition. And all of these artists become incredibly influenced by the notion that composition can be an art form. George Brecht, for example, makes a piece titled Eight Piano Transcriptions for David Tudor. David Tudor being the person who actually performs 433 for the first time in August of 1952. Or you can think of one step further out. This is Lawrence Wiener. And Lawrence Wiener does gloss white lacquer spray for two minutes at 40 pounds per square inch directly on the floor. You see that little white splotch, that's the art object. So when I talked to Lawrence Wiener, I said, were you interested in Cage? He says, well, I wasn't so interested in Cage, but I was interested in the ideas he put forward. I'm really interested in the notions of indeterminacy. Because of course, when you spray paint on the floor, it's going to do whatever it's going to do. It's totally indeterminate. Or artists like Robert Berry. And what you're seeing here is a poster that he makes for an exhibition that he does in Los Angeles, uh, 1969, where he goes to a scientific supply store and he buys measured volumes of uh, noble gases, helium, neon, argon, krypton, and xenon, and then he releases them into the atmosphere. And if you ask Robert, you know, were you interested in Cage? He says, absolutely. His book titled Silence, which comes out in 1961 as the first publication by Cage, was this hallmark reference that everyone was talking about, apparently. And when you release gases, they're going to be wholly indeterminate. And this was incredibly important to Robert Berry as well. Or people like Ian Wilson. And you're talking about a generation that's really interested in the notion of dematerialization of the art object. And Ian Wilson's taking it to a logical conclusion where he's saying that oral communication is a valid art form. That he's going to engage with you in a conversation. It's going to have a beginning, a middle, and an end in his mind. But how that conversation actually transpires is quite indeterminate. We can direct you in a particular way to have a conversation, but it's never going to be the same thing twice. And sort of the final notion of how one can think about contextualization, perhaps, is John Cage himself. So this is John Cage performing 433 in Harvard Square. 
It's not obviously an environment that lends itself to music. But if Cage's notion is that it's all about engaging with the world surrounding us, perhaps this is a fine way of looking at the piece. So finally, what I want to show you is just how things never really change. So going back to my porn collection, I was looking at some of these periodicals a couple of years ago. And this one struck me as being really weird. On the left hand, obviously, you have a naked woman. On the right hand side, you have a photograph of two sculptures. It's a Craig Kaufman and a uh, John McCracken. And what's really strange is that it's a photograph taken at the Museum of Modern Art. It's a photograph that was taken during the course of a show called Five Recent Acquisitions from 1969, curated by Kenneth McShine. And it's the same way that we continue to see those two pieces of art. This was um, two and a half years ago. This was installed at PS1. And this is yesterday. Some things we want to change and some things we can't change. We have these associations that we get stuck with. And it's so, much, it's so interesting to see how things get contextualized and recontextualized, but somehow things remain static forever. Thanks.